Hi, my name is Joe Miller, and over the past five years, I've helped more than 100 students write dissertations and create research proposals to help their applications to university. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the key structure to a research proposal, especially for those of you who are using this as part of your master's applications in the UK. Now, before we begin, it's important to note Research proposals have become an increasingly important part of the application process for a lot of academic courses in the UK, especially at the most prestigious universities like Oxford and Cambridge. It's also worth noting that research proposals are used across a variety of different subjects. And so while this video isn't tailored to any specific subject, I hope that you'll be able to take away some of the tips and implement it into your own research proposal. Another really important thing to note, which I learned when I was writing my own research proposals for, for my successful applications to Oxford and Cambridge at master's level, is that the admissions committee really value a coherent and clear structure. So before I walk you through what each section of your research proposal should include, I must stress the importance of using subtitles and proper signposting throughout so that it's clear to them what you're saying. So the first section of any great research proposal should include the research question. This should be short, concise and objective. A great research question is not biased towards any specific answer. For example, if you were writing an economics application, Rather than saying, how are Trump's tariffs hurting the US economy? Or to what extent are Trump's tariffs hurting the US economy? I would rather you say something like, are Trump's tariffs hurting the US economy? Because then it doesn't lend itself to any particular answer and there is no bias. This is something that the admissions committees are really going to look for. Another quick tip in this first section, I encourage lots of my students to add research hypotheses. When I was writing my own research proposals to applications at Oxford and Cambridge, this was really important because the people that I was sending them to, my potential supervisors at these universities, wanted to know what I thought would be the answer. Again, there should be no bias here. The second section to any great research proposal is your rationale or motivation for wanting to do this, this research. Please note that this is different to if you're putting together a research proposal as part of your undergraduate thesis, or even as part of your master's research. This is typically something we don't do at university, but when we're applying to university, it's really important. Remember, this is still part of a university application. Therefore, this second section is a really good way to show the admissions committee what research you've done in the past, why it's impressive, and why it lends itself to this research. There should be a very clear and coherent path from the research that you've done in the past to the research that you're proposing in your application. You can think of this as an add-on to your personal statement. The third section of any great research proposal is your literature review. Now in university applications, you won't have as many words for this, but it's still vital. A literature review includes all the relevant literature surrounding your research topic. It essentially shows off what research has been done by others in the past so that you can then evidence to the admissions committee or to your potential supervisor why your research will add value. I encourage all of my students to divide their literature review into themes or even sub themes so that it's clear what the different bodies of research are or the different schools of thought are and the overall direction that the literature is going in. It's nice to comment on the meta-narrative, so which piece of literature, which theory, which concept, which academic is, read, is really leading the argument or leading the debate on your topic. This will really help you to again show how your research is going to contribute. It's important to note, a top university like Oxford, Cambridge, LSE or so on, they simply don't want research for the sake of it. They don't want you to say that you're going to do some research simply because it interests you or you think it's something that realistically you could, you could do. They want something that's actually going to contribute. It's going to push the boundaries of the current body of scholarship that's out there. That's really important. Section four of any great literature review is an insight into the primary sources that you're going to use. Now, as somebody that did my master's in economic history, I can't stress enough 
how important this is. One of the criteria that a lot of universities look for in your applications is how realistic is that research? How realistic is your proposal? And I've seen lots of students over the years that have great ideas, but they're not very well thought out because they simply don't know how to actually tackle the research. The data might not be available, the sources might not exist, or they simply might have not done enough preparation to discover those sources. This section is therefore really important to show the admissions committee that not only have you got a well thought out research, research proposal, but that it's realistic that in the, the year or two years of your master's programme, you can actually achieve your research goals. So in this section, it's important that you actually state what your primary or secondary sources are going to be. Tell the university that you've already found them, you've already looked at them. You don't need to go into detail, you don't need to have analysed any data or collected any data yet, but show them that this exists. For example, when I applied to both Economic and Social History at Oxford and Cambridge, I built upon my previous undergraduate research at LSE by bringing in new sources. And in this section, I actually gave evidence of what that source was. And I even include, included some excerpts from the source itself. For example, in my section four, I included the specific source that I was using for my historic research. So I, I collected data from 1695 using something called the marriage duty assessment, a tax that was collected across England that was really useful for measuring living standards, especially per household, because it included the names of everybody that lived in every dwelling across the UK. Not only did I tell my supervisor or the admissions committee that I'd found this source, I actually included excerpts from it and even showed them an example of what my research analysis might look like. This kind of extra layer, layer of detail will go really far in convincing a potential supervisor at a university like Oxford or Cambridge that you have thought this through well enough that you are capable of doing the research. Again, again, remember, they are looking for whether it's realistic that you could complete this research in the time frame that you've got for a master's. For many people, this is the bottleneck that stops them getting an offer. The fifth and final section to any great research proposal is your research design and methodology. So this is where you're going to tell the admissions committee or your supervisor how you're going to analyse the primary source that you introduced in section four. There are loads of different approaches and some of them that you can find online, some of them you've probably learnt during your undergraduate degrees. This can span from quantitative analyses, where you use statistics or econometrics in Stata or, or Tableau, all the way to something like qualitative analysis, um, where you might conduct interviews or research certain themes within secondary literature. The really important thing to note, however, when you're including this section in your application to university is that it's an amazing opportunity for you to show off the skills and research you've done in the past. Therefore, I would urge you in an application, don't try anything new. Don't say that you're going to use a certain method if you've never done it before, or if it's not obvious from your previous modules or experience that you've got the skills to do that. This will simply scare the, the admissions committee and any potential supervisors. Instead, lean on your previous skills. For example, in my applications to university, I said that I was going to use quantitative analyses in my economic history research. Why? Because during my undergraduate degree, I'd completed modules in statistics and advanced econometrics, which I could then cite and bring up to convince the admissions team that not only was my research well thought out and well prepared, but I already had the skills. It isn't going to be a lot of additional work or effort for my supervisor to get me in a position where I can actually execute my research. As I said at the beginning, I've helped over 100 students brainstorm, draft, and then execute their research, either for applications or for their university degrees. And having that extra subject specific support can really be useful. As always, if you found this video useful, please do like and subscribe. If you have any pressing questions, please leave a comment below and we'll do our best to get back to you quickly. If you or any of your friends want one-to-one -one support, please do use the information on screen now 
so that we can find a tutor suitable for you. Otherwise, good luck with your applications.